guys, so I was reviewing some of my videos here on YouTube, and I was looking to see which ones have accumulated the most views and generated the most discussion. Now what I found is that in both of these areas, one of my most popular uploads was the one in which I was addressing a rhetorical tactic often employed by certain pro-choice persons who can't really defend their position with any real rationale and are therefore trying to use this ad hominem as a substitute for an actual argument or as an excuse that will allow them to avoid addressing the potentially valid or at least the possibly persuasive argument of a pro-life person who also happens to be male. And I didn't intend to go back and readdress this, but I do think that it is worthy of being addressed for reasons that I will list off later on in the video. And when I went back to look at this upload that was so very popular, I decided that I am not content with the quality of presentation and certainly not content with the clarity of message. I think that I can present all of the same points and in fact more in a fashion that is first off more economic but second off leaves a lot less room for miscommunication so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to go back and I'm going to revisit this tool where to distract people from an individual pro-life male's arguments a pro-choice person will say you're a man and attack his gender. So that's basically what you're going to have. You're going to have somebody like me who, on penalty of being accused of misogyny, will dare to be a man and yet extroversively disagree with the position that pro-choice leaders tell us that we should take. And this individual will come out and present an argument, maybe about the status of the fetus, the legality question, or a branch topic like the effectiveness of de jure restrictions for reducing abortion rates. It doesn't really matter. Almost invariably, somebody from the opposing side who can't defend their argument will turn around and they will say, you're a man. Now, this is a device designed to maintain the status quo. It is trying to circumvent future political loss by shutting up the opposition. And for this reason, a lot of people argue that it's not even worthy of being addressed. But personally, I disagree. Because while it's not an actual argument with real rationality behind it, it is a powerful rhetorical device for proliferating ignorance, and that it effectively cuts in half the number of people who can contribute material to our conversation in a fashion that may help us to have an educated position, to evolve in our understanding of the issue, or even just to better communicate with one another in the future. I think that that is a tragedy. I think that that is enough to warrant discussing, addressing, and dismantling this rhetorical tool. First off, I want to point out that whenever you try to distract attention from or discredit an argument based on a character characteristic held by the person who happens to be presenting it, such as his gender, this is an ad hominem fallacy. An individual's gender has absolutely nothing to do with the validity, invalidity, strength, or weakness of any argument that he or she presents on any issue ever. And it's not as though if I were to say 2 plus 2 equals 4, it's wrong, but then a woman says 2 plus 2 equals 4, it's right. No. 2 plus 2 equals 4 no matter who is expressing that point. So, whether or not I am a man has nothing to do with whether or not something I am saying is true and therefore worthy of your consideration. It's a red herring fallacy that distracts us from a central line of argumentation or a relevant issue by leading us down a rabbit trail that causes us to bicker about something that's not really relevant to what we were talking about before. For example, let's say that I said abortion should be illegal in all circumstances with the exception of rape. That is my position on abortion. To which somebody named Bethy turned around and said, well, you're a man. So I looked at Bethy and I said, well, Bethy, that's an ad hominem. And she said, no, no, Mr. Wartham Revolution, it's not an ad hominem. It's just something that demonstrates that yours is an uninformed opinion. And I asked her, how did you arrive at this conclusion? To which she responded, men cannot understand what women are going through because they are unable to experience pregnancy and therefore any position they arrive at on the issue of abortion is one adopted from a place of unempathetic if not outright hateful ignorance how how could you possibly understand or have an informed opinion about abortion if you can't even comprehend the basic experience of pregnancy now we're discussing whether or not I am capable of understanding pregnancy instead of whether or not abortion should be legal. But I actually want to follow that rabbit trail because even if we ignore the fact that this device is an ad hominem, perhaps twice over, and a red herring crammed into one super fallacy, there is still a serious error in the argument that it uses to claim I cannot understand pregnancy. It rests upon a central and unsupported assumption that in order to understand somebody else's experience, I would have to first walk in their shoes. I can't understand what women are going through because I have never been a woman. I don't understand the experience of pregnancy because I have never been pregnant. 
Now, the problem with this assertion is that it cannot be buttressed with empirical fact or supported by a logical argument. It is counter-scientific knowledge. It's not falsifiable. It can't be critically considered. You see, there are basically two possibilities here. The first is that, yes, walking in somebody's shoes is legitimately a prerequisite for understanding their experience. The second is that, no, no, it's not. It's either true or it's false. Now, if it's false, you clearly cannot prove that it's true because that would be a violation of the laws of logical consistency. So in order to illustrate my point, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second, and I will assume for the sake of argument that, yes, walking in somebody's shoes is a prerequisite for understanding their experience. But if that is the case, then before you or Bethy could possibly understand my experience, before you could know what I can understand, you would have to walk in my shoes, which you cannot do because you're not me and you're not existing in the exact same circumstances that I am. Therefore, this is a position which cannot be backed up with fact and cannot be affirmed no matter what you do. And if you can't support something with evidence, then the natural logical disposition towards it is atheistic. It is irrational to assume that this statement is true. So in review, this irrational rhetorical device is not only an ad hominem designed to shut up the opposition and proliferate ignorance, it is also a red herring fallacy, and it is in violation of the laws of logical consistency. But wait. There's more. Ignoring everything that I just said, what is to stop us from taking this rhetorical device and using it in application to the opposing side? Why is it acceptable for a woman to look at men and say, well, you've never experienced things from our side of the abortion debate, therefore you are ignorant and your opinion should be dismissed, but men can't look at women and say, well, you've never experienced things from the man's side of the abortion issue, therefore you're ignorant and we should dismiss your opinion. And I guess I'm going to leave it off at that. I think I've said enough. I apologize for the horrible editing, but thank you very much for watching my video.